Hi, I'm Shairi. Uh, I'm doing my PhD in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University in New York. My area of study is uh, modern South Asian history. I'll talk about some of the steps involved in applying to graduate school in the US based on my experience and on advice I had received in turn from others when I was applying. On the question of choosing which programs to apply to, I would definitely recommend not going by the name of the university. A university in the US might be renowned for one or two of its schools, but that does not imply the program you will apply to will be of the same caliber. So I think it is far wiser to base your choice on specific departments and the programs you'll be applying to and their standards and reputation than those of the universities. On choosing departments, the primary determining factor should be your project and your method. If, uh, say, it's primarily archival, you should focus on history, obviously, uh, as a department. If it is, say, ethnographic, then anthro uh, anthropology departments. Some people often end up with projects that are interdisciplinary and have the pot potential to go either way. In that case, you can base your decision on your choice of potential supervisors. Uh, but even if you are going by the first method, uh, going by um, your uh, archival or ethnographic method, I think it is important to keep in mind uh, the potential supervisor that you want to work with. So that should be your second uh, determining factor in the first case. So you should think about the scholars you want to work with. Uh, look up the departments they are in and apply accordingly. Uh, also keep in mind in most US PhD programs, the candidates committee is ultimately composed of about five members. So ultimately when you have formed the committee, it's not that all faculty members you work with would be working either in your specific region or even discipline or theme of interest. Uh, they would have to have some overlap with your project, but it's not given that they have to be in your region or uh, in your theme of interest, right? Uh, but when you apply, it is advisable to keep in mind who you want your primary supervisor to be. And it is safer to choose a person who has explicit interest and scholarship in the region you're focusing or on or on the conceptual frame, if that is more important to your project. Because as selection of PhD applicants go, these are the people, these potential supervisors will be the people who will have to ultimately commit to guiding you. And based on that commitment, the department would admit you. So what I'm basically saying is, even if your project is brilliant and the department as a whole thinks that you should be admitted to the program, if the person or the scholar you ultimately aim to work with declines it on, on, on a number of reasons, it might not have to do with your project. The person, say, might be going on a sabbatical that year and is no longer willing to take in more PhD students. Then even if you have a brilliant project, you might be denied admission. So it's really important to focus on your potential supervisor. Uh, and your SOP also has to reflect very convincingly why this faculty would be suitable for your research. And related to this, a not required but highly recommended step to take before you apply to any place is to actually reach out at a, at, at a slightly informal level to these potential supervisors, to these scholars you hope to work with. Uh, write to them a month or two before the application deadline, share a brief overview of your project proposal and why you're eager to work with them. In this email, you can ask them whether they think you are a good fit for the department. In my experience, this is extremely valuable. I did that. Uh, people who, ha who were advising me, other PhD students also did that. Uh, it's not that you should expect everyone to respond to you because a lot of them won't, but that's fine. But those who will, will actually give you a very honest sense of your chances in getting through the PhD program in that department. Uh, and based on those, you can actually decide which places uh, to forego from your list of applications or from your list of potential places you were going to apply to and places which actually have a higher chance. So you put in more, say, effort in your SOP and writing samples when you're preparing that particular application package. So it's a really valuable step to take. 
um, because uh, every application also has to be tailored to the department's focus. And if you know in advance that the department or the specific supervisor is not taking in students, or if they think that the project is not suitable for them, you basically not only save yourself time, but also money because each application costs a particular amount, right? Uh, the other less emphasized, but equally, if not more important aspect in this decision-making process is finding out about your potential supervisors as, as persons and supervisors and not just as scholars. Uh, and I think often in the frenzy of applying for a PhD, people tend to overlook the fact that you'll be spending five to seven years of your life working very closely with your supervisors. It is important to be aware, therefore, in advance, if your potential supervisor has not just ac has not just produced academically successful students, but students who have been happy working with them or have no significant grievances against them. I appreciate this might not be an easy task, but make sure as much as possible that the faculty member you want to work with has students who feel encouraged to pursue research under their guidance and feel comfortable working with them. Coming to the next step, which is preparing your application file. Uh, so this email that I, I, I mentioned, you would be writing that if you want to, you would be writing that uh, a month or two uh, before the deadline. And then accordingly, you would also start preparing your application file. Uh, so some of the comp components of that would be the SOP, the writing sample, and the GRE. And I'll talk briefly about all three of them. Um, Coming to the SOP, uh, this might almost be common sense actually, but it wouldn't hurt underlining that it's best to approach the SOP in terms of the different sections rather than trying to sit and write the whole thing at one go. So first identify the sections that need to go into the SOP and work on each separately. So do your research, write each paragraph or section, however long each of these would be, revise them, um, incorporate feedback, um, and keep polishing each of these sections differently. And as you apply for each program, you can put these sections together depending on the word limit. For one, it is this, this process of approaching it by sections rather than as the SOP as a whole is, it is a, I think it is a far less daunting task than trying to compose it uh, entirely together from the very first draft. And two, it also helps you refine and actually pay equal attention to the sections individually. Your project and specifically the question you wish to pursue has to be, of course, included, but you also have to give a sense of, say, the sources and methods which will enable you to answer that research question. And finally, a section on uh, what, what makes you, your past training, your past interests, your past research, all of these make you, or at least you have to make the case convincingly that all of these make you a fit candidate to pursue that research successfully. Uh, and finally, a section on why you think that particular department is best suited for you to do that research. And here you might mention the courses the department offers and the research some of the faculty do and how that would influence your project. Uh, you have to, of course, tailor, especially this last section about department fit according to each program you're applying to. The other important component of the application is the writing sample. The first priority, in my opinion, should be to choose something that demonstrates your best scholarly writing. The content or topic of the paper is much less important. Then, if you have, say, more than one option, you can decide to choose an archival research-based piece for a history department or a literary analysis piece for a literature department and so on. But it's important to keep to the word limit for both the SOP and the writing sample. For the GRE, and this is the final component that I'll be talking about, I understand it might be a source of anxiety for all applicants. There is really not much to say other than, of course, do your best, higher the score, better the chances. But also having said that, I would say that if you do end up with a uh, with an unsatisfactory score on the quantitative section, it does not make a huge difference in a humanities and social science program. The score is more often than not a cutoff for graduate schools to approve the department's selection of candidates. So a low score in itself might not matter. But of course, if there are two applicants with 
with the equally um, with equal academic caliber, the GRE might become the final determining factor. I know this is not great to hear, but all this is to say that you have to do your best for the GRE. But once done, if the scores are low, it does not mean you don't have a good chance of getting through a PhD program if the other components of your application are outstanding. So don't give up, keep at it. That will be all from me today. All the best with your applications.